Thank you so much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, my first slide really shows the view of the world, both from the water and the land point of view. Um, I think the question that as I understood this discussion was really how zoos and aquaria could foster a culture of care and conservation um, amongst their visitors and amongst all of us. Um, I think it's actually kind of a difficult thing. It's a difficult task for zoos and aquaria to foster a culture of conservation because for one, one reason is because all the visitors that come arrive with previously held ideas about the environment and they're all very different. Yeah. This very recent study from the University of Chicago and Yale School of Forestry shows that people are not either pro or anti-environment in their attitudes, but there's a wide variety of views held about the environment. Um, it's, it's more like a gradient or a spectrum, you could think of it going from green to brown, um, that people's views that are preconceived that they come into uh, to be visitors in zoos and aquariums. And, and they have different views about the danger of climate change. Most people's previously held beliefs are somewhat solidified by the time they arrive. So during the short visit that they have at the zoo or aquarium, it's gonna be hard to get them to go out and act on behalf of the environment. There's also a marketing message that um, a lot of zoos, and I don't mean to lump everyone together, we know that they're all not the same, but, but oftentimes zoos and aquariums as a group, um, they have education in their mission statements, but they're really set up and marketed more as entertainment um, venues. And so if, if zoos and aquariums are entertainment venues in their history, uh, you know, the history of the menagerie and so on, um, and their business model is also set up as um, an ent entertainment model, then when visitors arrive after they have been marketed as such, they come in and guess what? They want to be entertained. Uh, and so it's, it, that makes it hard to deliver uh, this other message. As well, entertainment attractions and zoos and aquariums send conflicting messages about how to respect animals and when they are presented as a spectacle or to ask to perform in shows. I think there's very good in intentions on the part of zoos and aquariums to educate and there's you know, often signs, the websites. These are all very conscious raising um, and, and that's great. But I think if zoos and aquariums really want to change behavior and mobilize the millions of people that come through and visit them, um, it, it might require more of a political approach. A small number of zoos and aquaria, like the Monterey Bay Aquarium, do promote policy aimed at protecting the environment. Um, but most aquariums and zoos really kind of shy away, away from the political arguments because this does get in the way of the entertainment uh, factor. There's also, additionally and crucially, I think, um, the, the idea that if you're an entertainment um, institution, this basic science information about evolution is sometimes avoided altogether and, and things like magic are invoked. Um, um, but, but more just to kind of on a very practical level, I think the, the idea of having gift shops full of plastic um, uh, that are really asking visitors to purchase these trinkets and these are harmful materials as we know for the ocean as we saw uh, previously um, in Sylvia's talk, they're threatening the health and well-being of wild animals. Um, so I think from a design perspective, when entertainment is the main uh, prerogative, it, it, it becomes almost like this arms race uh, for the biggest, brightest, most mind-blowing wow factor and we, when the dollars are focused in zoos and aquaria on these expenditures, I think it's hard to focus on, conver on conservation, even though it's not bad in and of itself to be entertained, it's just a competing focus. Um, I think that we have to also look at the performance of students today. And um, if today's visitors are not gonna act on behalf of our environment, we have to look at the future visitors. And, and students in the United States have very poor performance 
in science, where we rank, believe it or not, 27th in science. We have even lower math rankings. We're ranking 36th in math, and it's dropping down. So if this trend continues, our students won't have the basic science understanding to comprehend what's happening to the environment, let alone act on behalf of the environment. Um, even though they might have the technological tools to do so, we're leaving them behind. So in this world that is you know, facing dire threats, human-created environmental threats and massive species extinctions, um, the institutions of zoos and aquaria need to, and I think can do more uh, toward a conservation ethic. What if zoos and aquariums, like other contemporary institutions such as museums, could become hybrid organizations focused on seriously training and educating the next generation of capable environmental advocates? I'm an architect uh, and I'm glad that um, it was pointed out that it's fun to think about things if you're not an expert, and I'm not an expert in zoos and aquaria, but I do like to think about them, and I'm passionate about ecology. Because ecology is about studying the interactions among the organisms and their environment, which in a way is another definition of architecture. We study how, um, how organisms interact with environment. And it's ecological thinking, this idea that everything is connected um, that links our work, I guess, because our work is a very different things, not only um, environmental spaces, but buildings as well, um, and connecting the, to the environments around them. So we've been trying to understand how these interactions on a social, environmental, and intellectual level are, uh, can be made. Um, so we've been designing buildings and urban spaces that connect, try to connect these dots. So we've been working with organizations like the National Aquarium, uh, that want to harness design to help reorient their work to design a new future for themselves and become hybrid institutions to achieve their missions. Uh, this example, uh, we, we converted this former airport in Chicago, on Chicago's lakefront into a public park. This was the design for the park uh, that's both a resting stop for migratory birds, as in the last map, but also a place for people to explore nature within the city. Through the design of the, the site, which is really the design for habitat to encourage um, animals to come, it, it provides an extension of the mu museum campus, which is nearby, so that uh, the museums could actually make use of this space as an outdoor campus. Um, there are year-round activities uh, being planned, kind of an outdoor classroom um, and you can see that we've even tried to support habitat by sinking a sunken ship into the, um, into the lake there that you can evidently buy them on the internet. So we were <laughs> proposing getting one for this purpose of creating a little habitat. But the cool thing is it, it's actually starting to be built. It's be, about a third of the site has been converted, converted from this former airport. Um, another, another building that we recently completed is the Arcus Center in Kalamazoo, and, and it's designed to be a place to gather future leaders in the field of social justice and environmental justice. Um, and there wasn't really a precedent for this kind of school, um, so we helped them to figure out how they could create a building that would embody this, this mission um, so that the future leaders could come here and learn how to um, to lead in the social justice realm. But it was even built in the way that we built it was through a diverse collective of builders and artisans you know, from different um, walks of life, different parts of society, different races, different genders. And, and it's a green building whose walls are made of trees that really absorb more carbon in their lifetime than they emit uh, being present in the building. Um, as, an, as a tall building, it's really about creating um, a city that has a more compact footprint. Um, the Aqua Tower also pointed out with all of its, its balconies a way to start to create uh, potentially community in the, in the vertical dimension. 
Uh, these balcony shapes also reduce the, the wind um, pressure on the building so people can step outside and be part of the environment and part of the city at the same time. Um, and they can occupy these over the whole height of the building. But this compact, the compact footprint of, of, a, of a single tower, which is equivalent to you know, 333 um, acres of land, also reduces the carbon footprint of those who live there. So a, a, a person living in, the, in a tall building uh, produces about seven times less carbon per household. And it's also a building that's avian safe. <laughs> um, it protects birds uh, from collisions with the glass as this peregrine falcon likes to perch there, can attest. Now let's talk a little bit about how architecture and nature intertwine in an urban environment and how education can help promote a culture of care and conservation. In Chicago, in Lincoln Park, we worked with the Lincoln Park Zoo to design um, an education pavilion. Here, we imagined um, out of a broken down turn of the century pond that was very smelly and, and uh, only about three feet deep, we turned that into this vibrant habitat, a zoo without cages, where animals actually volunteer to come and exhibit themselves. <laughs> it, it, it had to do with um, creating a piece of urban infrastructure as well. So this, this new pond, which is much deeper, 20 feet deep, um, filter uses plants to filter the urban runoff water. Um, it's also a very diverse, bio, biodiverse habitat right within the city. Uh, so you don't have to go so far outside to, to see animals and diversity. Um, it has birds. It's a rookery for about, uh, there were 400 pair of black crowned night herons nesting there. And it's also used by mammals. Coyotes like to use this at, at night. Uh, which are good animals for the urban realm. They don't eat dogs, contrary to popular belief. Um, <laughs> but it's also a stormwater management system, um, and it's also a place for education, which is the main purpose, um, and weddings. Of course, mostly architects get married there. <laughs> but um, it's also architecture, uh, part of the city, and it's become a place for events that we couldn't even have imagined when we designed it. So the, the project really creates an ecology in a certain sense, an interaction of these uses, and heightens the awareness of interconnectivity with nature and the city. Well, urban zoos and aquariums are viewed as um, positive catalysts, oftentimes in economic engines for cities. These major investments, the organizations and their buildings, could be reimagined for a better future. So over the past several years, I've become invested in this issue by working with John Racanelli at, at the National Aquarium and developing a street, strategic plan, plan that offers recommendations for the organization's future. Located on, on those two separate piers that you saw, separated by this slip, the first element of the plan is really to tie together the two piers with an outdoor habitat as um, a perched wetland. It's designed to reintroduce biodiversity there at the Inner Harbor and inspired by these different types of landscape that are common in the Chesapeake area. Um, but it's also just revitalizing a habitat in an, un, in an urbanized waterfront. It's gonna create an outdoor educational exhibit as well um, so that people can stand on the pier and see animals coming to that space. Like Lincoln Park Zoo, it uses natural systems to improve the water quality of the harbor water and makes the expertise of the aquarium staff uh, visible outside the walls of the National Aquarium. So zoos and aquariums are home to unique animals, expert knowledge, and technical facilities. All of these things could undergird a new kind of school with an essential mission to instill in people, beginning at a very young age, a holistic understanding of the relationship between humans and the health of the planet. And cutting edge as institutions are beginning to advance in this area. Um, this is a picture of the New York Harbor School. What's well, actually Education Secretary Arnie Duncan, um, who is 
commending the school um, for teaching students environmental awareness, but at the same time, it's preparing them for careers in an urban area surrounded by water. The Harbor School has even partnered with the New York Aquarium to provide a place to learn diving during the winter months. So if you try to just imagine how cool it would be for a kid from an underserved community to feel like a rock star, you know, when they're diving in front of the aquarium visitors. Um, and all of this um, would be building school skills for the students for future careers. Uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium is planning a new ocean leadership center near its aquarium facil facility, planning to expand its reach to students and teachers. And these buildings should be, these new hybrid institutions should be green buildings, creating a synthesis between ecological, structural, technical, and architectural systems, and demonstrating what conservation looks like in buildings. With zoos and aquaria, there's even an opportunity to use animal waste um, at the center for, to create energy, just so nothing is wasted, just like in nature. In the future, it would be amazing, and it would be amazing if it came out of a conversation like we're having tonight, if schools were housed inside zoos and aquariums. Not to create more zoo and aquarium experts or jobs, but really to create multifaceted institutions that take advantage of all the science, all the collection, all the experts that they house, and deeply engaging students with science and education and the environment. And the good news is there are a few cutting edge examples, uh, especially in the museum world right now. The Science Center School is housed within the California Science Center in South LA. Um, it's an urban school, not a magnet school. It's a, a local, local urban school. So it's a perfect example of this ecological thinking. Um, it takes underserved areas. It take, it's in an underserved area um, that has a strong need, you know, in education nearby, and it pairs it with a strong institutional asset. We are currently working on a new science and education wing at the American Museum of Natural History. Um, this is a museum that supports level, all levels of education, actually, inside the museum and out. Um, its highest level of education is actually at the university level. They, they confer uh, PhD um, degrees to postgraduate students within the walls. And so this new center inside the building will house collections, um, interdisciplinary science programs, education labs, um, and an environment that makes the connections between all these different assets. So the building makes the halls of the exhibits, and you can see in section here, integral to the education mission. So they connect directly to 10 adjacent buildings and make those collections available to students. This is an image of a giant science fair happening in Milstein Hall at, at AM and H. So, to conclude, I think our zoos and aquariums can join other institutions like science and nature museums and, and become schools or, or, or integrate like a stronger, more intense um, relationships with existing urban schools. So the question of can zoos and aquarium promote conservation, I think yes, absolutely. Uh, they'll need to transform themselves into highly effective conservation educators who use their facilities and their strategic urban locations to train the next generation of environmental stewards and innovators. Thank you very much.